Okay. Uh, well, uh, it is a privilege to address everyone about a subject that I feel very passionate about. Uh, for the past oh, 30 plus years in my medical practice, I've been watching uh, severe or organic diseases, high blood pressure, diabetes, clogged arteries, inflammatory diseases, uh, resolve uh, diseases I was told never uh, go away. Uh, they are uh, relentlessly progressive. And I've become aware of just the appalling, embarrassing lack uh, that my fellow physicians have when it comes to the effect of our patients' daily diet upon their bodies and the diseases they are bringing us to treat. So I've been going around uh, as part of our nonprofit uh, Moving Medicine Forward initiative and going to the nation's medical schools and hospitals and clinic and telling the young docs that uh, med school, you're going to learn all these diseases from smallpox to leprosy. But when you open the door in practice, no matter what specialty you're in, any of these column on the left or the right, every one of these folks, when they look in their waiting room, who's sitting there, Mr. and Mrs. America, uh, they're mathematically going to be either overweight or clinically obese. They're going to have clogged arteries showing up as angina and claudication and strokes, uh, as well as elevated fats in the blood, high blood pressure. You'll see rampant type 2 diabetes and a, uh, and a host of inflammatory diseases affecting every organ system, lungs, gut, uh, joint, immune system. Uh, and yeah, these are the diseases that are uh, responsible for most of the time and energy being absorbed by Western medicine. But when you ask the professors what's the cause of these diseases, you run into two words to stop all further thought. Etiology unknown. We don't know the cause of these diseases. Uh, and if you don't know the cause of the disease, you can't cure it. You, it reduces the doctor to the manager of chronic disease, will manage your high blood pressure, will manage your diabetes. What an unsatisfying way to practice medicine. And the message you give the patient every time you see them in a month and you raise their dose of beta blockers and raise their dose of insulin is you're going to be sick the rest of your life. You're never going to get better. Uh, and you'll take these pills the rest of your life. What a dismal, hopeless way to practice medicine. And it's actually unnecessary because these are actually all eminently reversible diseases. When the professors in the back of the room with their arms full of say, we don't know the cause of these diseases. Really? I said, doctors, take a look at what your patients are eating. Uh, I wish when I was in med school, some resident or internal medicine professor sat me down and said, let's talk about the reality of what your patient's daily diet is doing to their bodies uh, and, uh, and how it fits in with these diseases you're treating. So as I explained previously, if one starts, uh, one eats a plant-based meal, a nice colorful salad, here's bean and vegetable soup, here's quinoa and zucchini bows, here's green yellow veggies. You eat a meal like this, and an hour later, I sneak up on you with a needle and a syringe in my hand, and I draw five cc's of blood into a glass top tube, and let it clot and spin it down in a centrifuge. Uh, we're, this is what we're going to see. We're going to see the red clot at the bottom. The liquid part of the blood is transparent. You can read newsprint through normal serum. This is what your blood should look like. You have to eat a fatty meal. But you eat a standard Western meal, bacon, eggs for breakfast, a cheeseburger and fries for lunch, a dinner of fried chicken or a pizza, ice cream for dessert. You eat a meal like this. And for the next five hours, your blood is running thick with fat. Uh, it has this milky appearance to it. It's technically called postprandial lipemia. Lipemia means fat in the blood. Postprandial means the after eating. Now, Grant, not everybody shows it this optically densely, but everybody has a wave of fat that goes through their arteries after we eat a meal. How else is it going? Where else is it going to go? Uh, and I was serious about that five hour number. Here's Kuo's classic study, they gave someone a fatty meal at hour zero, and they drew blood once an hour for six hours, and they took those blood tubes and put them one after another into an instrument, a spectrophotometer that measures how fatty, how milky the blood is looking. And you can see the blood getting fattier and fattier and fattier and fattier. It takes the liver five hours to begin, begin to clear the fat out of the blood. And during this time when the blood is running thick with fat, evil things are happening in the body. Um, the, um, 
The artery walls are getting injured from the oxidized cholesterol and saturated fat that opens the door to atherosclerotic plaque formation. I'll show you uh, the story of that in a minute. Uh, the fat flows to the abdominal fat tissues and sticks there, increasing obesity. The fat works its way into the liver and muscle cells, clogging up insulin receptors, uh, increasing uh, type 2 diabetes. I'll show you more about that in a minute. And the saturated fats fan inflammatory reactions throughout the body. There's a pro-inflammatory diet. And for five solid hours, uh, this kind of damage is being done. Well, think about what that means, the way most people conduct their eating day. They start out with bacon and eggs or an egg McMuffin or something fatty. And for the next five hours, all morning, their run, blood is running thick with fat, their arteries are injured, obesity is increasing, diabetes, inflammation going up. Takes the liver till about noontime to begin, begin to clear the breakfast time fat out of the blood when time for lunch and another wave of fat goes through the bloodstream and all the afternoon, the arteries are injured, obesity is increasing, diabetes and inflammation getting worse takes the liver till about six in the evening to begin, begin to clear the lunchtime fat out of the blood when time to visit the colonel and send another wave of fat through the bloodstream and all evening, arteries are injured, obesity is increasing, diabetes and inflammation getting worse. Takes till about 10 o'clock at night for the liver to begin to clear this fat out of the blood when on the way back to the bedroom, we polish off a half pint of ice cream and send another wave of fat through the bloodstream. And the truth is when any doctor opens the door, they're waiting in an emergency room, outpatient clinic, it doesn't matter. The people who are sitting there um, have generally have blood that looks like this. How do I say that? Because we are an affluent society and hunger is just not tolerated. If you're at home and you're hungry, you put your head in the fridge for last night's dinner leftovers. If you're out, you head for the convenience store or the restaurant. We do not put up with hunger in our society, no matter how junky the food might be that we put in our system. And as a result, we are constantly in the postprandial state. Uh, and knowing that that's the state of the American bloodstream, we need to drill down further. Now, I've been focusing on the fat because that is the most visible uh, of the substances in the bloodstream to show how long each meal affects our physiology. But there's much more than fat in that blood. Uh, it is a high salt diet. There's uh, salt in the meat, salt in the cheese, salt in the fries, salt in the chips, salt in the spaghetti sauce at the Italian restaurant. It's a high salt diet that stiffens our arteries and makes us retain fluid, then raises our blood pressure, increases our risk for heart attacks and strokes and congestive heart failure and kidney failure. But also we're learning that high sodium diets set off TH17 helper cells that open the door to autoimmune diseases like lupus. High salt diets are not good for the human system. Who knew? But we know now. So that's the problem with eating too much salt during the day. And then there's eating sugar. Now, I'm not talking about a half a teaspoon of sugar of, tea, of syrup in your coffee for a sweetener. That's how it's supposed to be used as a flavoring. I'm talking about eating sugar as a food. When you eat a, even a vegan donut or a cupcake or a chocolate bar or drink a cola drink, you are flooding your system with grams and grams of fructose, maltose, dextrose, highly oxidizable sugars. And that, and those sugars stick to proteins all over the body. They glycosylate the proteins all over the body, in your blood, your tissues. And that's not a good thing. That stiffens and injures the protein. But then your own 98.6 body heat takes these glycosylated proteins and does a low-grade reaction, what's called the Maillard reaction, that every baker knows uh, in, in the bakery, they combined carbohydrates in the pastry flour, well, along with protein and the wheat gluten, uh, and it glycosylates the protein, then they put it in the oven and heat it. And then that, uh, that glycosylated protein oxidizes and it forms advanced glycation end products like acrylamides and other damaging substances that are teeming with free radicals that rip electrons off, off your cells and off membranes and off chromosomes and protein, destructive molecules, these AGEs. Don't worry about the initials so much, remember uh, the, the name so much, but remember the initials because these things age you. It's one thing to make AGEs on the surface of a French baguette. You don't want to eat a lot of bread crust for that reason. But you sure don't want to run the Maillard reaction in the 
proteins of your crystalline lens of your eye. It's a great way to open the door to cataracts. You don't want to run the Maillard reaction on the elastin fibers of your skin. It's a great way to turn your skin into an old suitcase. And you sure don't want to run the Maillard reaction on the inner lining of the blood vessels to your brain. I'll show you what that does uh, to the, the vessels that have to transport oxygen into your brain cells. Um, the You can create uh, you can get exposed to these AGEs in two ways, by eating sugars and letting your body heat run the Maillard reaction on your own proteins, or you can eat carbohydrates that have been cooked at high temperature, like potato chips that are teeming with free radicals. So we bombard our tissue with these free radicals by uh, consuming carbohydrates that have been processed. This does not happen when you eat an apple. It doesn't happen when you eat a mango or a, a potato. This, these are processed, concentrated sugars that have been processed with heat. But it turns out that these cooked carbohydrates are not the main villains. They're not the main source of AGEs in a diet. You know what it is? Cooking animal muscle at high temperature, for grilling the burger, frying the chicken, grilling the bacon. These generate more AGEs than any uh, potato chip could ever contain. And most Americans and people in all Western countries, Australia, UK, Canada, they're at least once or twice a day eating a meal like this and then flooding their tissues. Mm -hmm.